You know, I hope it works. Uh, good morning. Welcome to CSIS. Uh, thank you very much for coming out. We're uh, deeply appreciative to both you and to our speakers. Uh, many of you are friends in the room, and so we're glad you're here. Uh, we're looking forward to this event, which will be digital trade in the international economy. I'm not sure that our speakers need an introduction. Their bios are on our website. Um, we're eager to hear what they have to say. The format will be, Meredith will begin uh, with the presentation. Uh, Jeff will then make a few remarks, and uh, Jamie will be to clean up. We're, we're uh, really grateful that they're here. Um, we'll then throw it open to questions, uh, to a more interactive discussion. This is a round table, so we are looking forward to your remarks. Um, we all, of course, have uh, set questions if you're quiet at the beginning, but uh, we're hopeful that you'll, you'll uh, get around that. So with that, let me um, turn uh, to Meredith and ask her to begin with her presentation. Hey, thanks, Jim. It's really great to be back here in the, the new building. It's so beautiful. So I'm so excited for CSIS. Um, it's interesting, and in, uh, what I love about Washington, sort of the old adage that uh, adage that um, a couple of weeks can be a lifetime or at least a 17-year locust cycle. You know, we've done our report, which is raw material for these guys, and we try to come up with uh, generally agreed, well-vetted numbers and analysis that can be used to plug into the political process here, uh, or not be used depending on their choices. So I'm basically here to set the stage, but really time has moved on since we've gotten uh, the bipartisan Congressional Trade Priorities Bill introduced. These guys have another, there is another bill on, on digital economy that's also gotten some attention, 1789. Uh, so that's kind of where the action is, but I wanted to just kind of lay out a few things that we were seeing to set the stage. And as I see around the table, there's a lot of experts in the room that know this topic. Uh, very well, so please feel free to, to jump in and make comments. Um, the overview of our study, we, we did a, a quick a study on the digital trade in the U.S. and global economies. We're halfway done. We just issued part one a couple of months ago. And uh, did, as an overview, we looked at the U.S. industry and tried to profile it, figure out what the U.S. footprint was here. Uh, the U.S. industry deals with you know, digitally delivered content, music, games, videos, books, social media, search engines, communication services, email and text messaging, software services and data services, processing and storage, and then cloud computing platform services. So that's kind of what we're talking about. This is a cool graph that's in our report. And Kate, Kate Linton from the ITC, I will not defer to you to explain it, but it's just, it's just a fascinating work of art to me, I think. Um, it just talks about kind of the multi-dimensional multi nature of what the companies, the major U.S. companies are doing right now. And it seems to me that they're creating the technologies and the products, and then they're all trying to compete in each other's pace. And where the other firm created something, they're trying to get in and, and compete right along with it. And uh, I mean, if you understand the size of these, these companies, they're, they're all US-based firms. I mean, Apple, uh, we were checking, had you know, $170 billion of revenue based on a really good first quarter in 2013. Uh, Microsoft, 78 billion. Uh, Google, 56 billion. Amazon, 61. And then you've got, you know, Facebook is trying to monetize their operations, 7 billion and really growing and very, very popular. So if you look at the U.S. economic footprint, folks that are trying to decide what the U.S. interest is in this area, this is a little bit of a snapshot of some of the stuff that we saw. It's really multi-dimensional. Multi um, you know, you've got a huge amount of creative destruction and, frankly, wealth creation, you know, in Silicon Valley as the smaller folks innovate and then try to get bought up by the bigger guys. So the second section of our report looks at what, what's happening with internet, internet technologies, how they're impacting the broader economy. What are the reverberations to the, the machine tool manufacturer in, in Ohio? Um, and we see huge effects on retail e-commerce, financial services, professional services, 
healthcare, you know, this tele telemedicine, records management, diagnostics, and then also express delivery, online education. This is kind of the reverberations, the, the, the ripples effect throughout the economy of how processes are changing. Uh, just an interesting uh, uh, chart here, I thought, uh, percent of revenue that's generated by internet sales. So the, right now, snapshot 2010, you look at manufacturing shipments, okay, 46% of manufacturing shipments are generated by internet sales. Now that's not necessarily new, it might be old sales that were, were done over the telephone, but almost 50% of their sales are now internet sales. Uh, and this, you know, really goes goes down to all sorts of sectors of the economy. And I just thought that was an interesting uh, percentage and snapshot of what was going on there in terms of converting over to business on the internet. Oh, this is just another chart that uh, survey of U.S. industry leaders, and this is what business leaders think is going to transform. How much? Uh, which, which, which sectors are going to be transformed the most by the digital economy. So 72% of business leaders think that IT and technology will be changed uh, the most, greatly transformed. I thought it was interesting here, the government, we're down at only 17% of business leaders think there's going to change, much is going to change in the government. So that's a little worrisome. <laughs> okay. And then we come up with the, you know, these basic numbers, trying to, to quantify this um, huge amount of difficulty in just finding numbers. I think the OECD is looking for some generally agreed global numbers, but uh, U.S. cross-border services trade, uh, $356 billion in 2011. That's up from about $282 billion in 2007. And then imports, uh, $221 billion in imports. Uh, for Heather, I thought the interesting thing f is, the, is the huge footprint in Europe. I mean, we are, both our exports and our investment in Europe is huge, and Europe really dominates the story if you had to pick one. So exports by geography, 42% to Europe, and then only 18% to Latin America. And we're importing a lot from, from the EU, EU as well. Uh, and then you look at foreign direct investment, $84 billion in, in Europe compared to only 31 in, in uh, Asia. Okay, there's a trend line, you know, everything's growing fast, but exports are growing faster than imports. That's always good. Uh, this is just uh, where, where this is going geographically, uh, exports and imports. If you look at exports, uh, the, the focus there in the smaller circle to the right uh, is the distribution in Europe. The UK is getting a lot, a uh, huge, huge amount there. UK and Netherlands, I think, are, the, are big. Another thing that struck me, here's our, the graph of the investment position, uh, $80 billion to Europe again. There we go. Uh, just it, as a snapshot, geographic breakdown of Facebook's 1.6 billion users. Uh, kind of this is one, one of these companies' global footprint. I think what's interesting is the distribution here of all the users on the left-hand side, you know, fairly evenly distributed. And then you look at where the revenue's coming, uh, mostly from, from the U.S. Uh, and as, you know, Facebook struggles to monetize, um, that'll change. Um, but really, the internet economy is dispersed globally. I mean, everyone's using it, and it's gone, and it's moved quickly. And our, the, I won't get into any detail here, but the report also looks at the barriers, trying to describe them. Uh, uh, Kate Linton here spent a great amount of time with some uh, just very uh, well-vetted description of what, what problems U.S. companies are facing out there. Uh, localization barriers, privacy, a big issue with the EU, of course, IPR protection, censor censorship, 
uh, border measures and then you know just the balkanization of trying to put up national walls around internet economies more barriers that's kind of the same list so what we're going to be doing uh, going into July July 14th we'll release part two of our study uh, and it will be quantifying uh, sort of econometric modeling and data analysis for both trade levels and barriers. Um, we're going to look at some case studies, so anybody has, has contacts with companies that would like to be featured, um, it's usually pretty good, uh, good, good to kind of get uh, case studies of particular issues companies are facing. <laughs> 10,000 people have received a questionnaire from the International Trade Commission asking them how their surviving in the internet economy. So we sh we're actually getting a fairly good response rate on those. And it's very hard quantifiable data that uh, is, I think it's easier for the government to get than, than maybe a think tank or something. So hopefully there'll be some uh, good numbers that are, are gleaned from that. And then finally, uh, Congress is, uh, and Senator Wyden and Senator Thune are really looking at small and medium-sized enterprises. Is there a disproportionate effect of the digital economy on these guys, or are, are they doing better than the bigger guys based on the digital economy? So those will be some of the things as a teaser for what will be coming out in July. Um, but we would really appreciate your input, any perspective you have, questions that you might think we could answer that would be useful to the overall debate, which is really the exciting thing that's going on right now in the sense that uh, the trade world has really moved miles uh, with the, the issuance of the, the Congress congressional piece of legislation on trade promotion authority, which I'm interested to hear about. So thank you. Good morning. My name is Jeff Farah. I'm counsel to the Senate Commerce Committee, where I advise Ranking Member Thune on telecommunications, technology, and internet policy. Uh, I was fortunate enough to work with my friend and colleague, Jamie White, from Senator Wyden's office on the Digital Trade Act of 2013, which our bosses introduced the end of last year. The, the goal of the Digital Trade Act is to set forward a series of negotiating principles for internet-enabled commerce. The big ticket items are trying to eliminate impediments to cross-border data flows and localization barriers. Uh, it, it's something that we're, the, the goal of the Digital Trade Act is to try and influence a variety of, of agreements. So you have traditional international trade agreements of which we're all familiar, such as the TTIP, uh, as well as the Trans-Pacific Partnership, but also to try and influence other agreements, such as internet governance agreements and things like the US-EU Safe Harbor Agreement, uh, which is allowed for liberalization of cross-border data flows between the European Union and the United States, despite our, our differing privacy regimes. I'll let Jamie talk a little bit about the importance of the Digital Trade Act from more of a purely finance committee perspective, but I thought I would, I would share some of, of our insights from why we view this as being important to the Commerce Committee's jurisdiction. Uh, the first is that I, I mentioned the EU-US safe harbor. Uh, there's, there's been you know, a lot of rumblings about how some of the, the NSA revelations will affect the transatlantic relationship and how that would affect the safe harbor. Uh, from, from where we sit, the, the safe harbor has been a, a fantastic tool for companies and individuals to be able to share data uh, across the Atlantic. And we're doing what we can to interface with the Commerce Department and the FTC to try and preserve that ability. The Digital Trade Act, in addition to discussing cross-border data flows and localization measures, also speaks to the issue of intermediary liability. And, and these are the, this is the legal regime that allows for platform internet sites in the United States to have certain liability protections so that third-party content uh, is able to, to, to ride on that platform. And, and this is something that we think is integral to the success story of the U.S. internet economy. Uh, it's something that uh, we think the United States has gotten the balance largely right, both through the Communications Decency Act, which is under the jurisdiction of the Commerce Committee, uh, as well as some of the laws that affect intellectual property. And as Meredith alluded to, the ability of small businesses to be able to utilize these platform sites to send their goods to market 
is really something that's this unprecedented in international commerce it's something that we believe the united states government should try and support it wherever it can and while i think many of the people at this round table are representing larger enterprises it's something that i think we should all keep in mind that it is small and medium-sized enterprises that really benefit from the ability to use the internet to send their products overseas tomorrow the finance committee will have its first hearing on trade promotion authority and we'll be interested to see what the reaction is from some of the members to the inclusion of digital trade language in, in trade promotion in the trade promotion authority bill uh, from Senator Thune's office perspective, we were very pleased to be able to work with Ranking Member Hatch and share our perspective on why digital trade language belonged in the Trade Promotion Authority, why Commerce Committee Republicans especially are interested in seeing this language in, in final trade agreements. It's an interesting thing because I, I, we'll, we'll be closely trying to determine how members are, are thinking about these issues because from our committee's perspective, the Commerce Committee Republicans are, are very much accustomed to talking about internet policy issues in a way where we believe the government should try and have a hands-off approach in as much as is possible. And it's something that a lot of the Finance Committee members and I imagine Ways and Means Committee members um, are, are not as used to talking about and thinking about. And so you know, we'll be looking to uh, you know, educate members as, as need be and try and make the cases to, to why this language is important and that we need to have binding and enforceable commitments in our trade agreements uh, to ensure that, that digital trade continues to flourish. And I would also note that as important as, as trade promotion authority is, this is really just the beginning of what Senator Wyden and Senator Thune are, are really trying to do. Our goal is to be able to have a coalition of senators who believe in these issues, who understand these issues, and are going to want to push for strong language in final trade agreements and be able to make sure that our trading partners are living up to the commitments that they make. In addition, we'll be looking to other types of, of internet policy agreements that I mentioned previously, uh, because fundamentally this is an issue of internet policy. Uh, it, 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 of course, is a trade policy as well, but there are multi-stakeholder fora that, that the United States government uh, is sometimes uh, standing alone or standing among uh, a few participants and you know we believe that Congress should try and support the administration where it is it is standing for the, the correct things when it comes to uh, a, a hands-off approach to internet policy. I think I'll leave my comments there and I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, that was that was really great. Um, I think what I'll do is sort of describe how we got here um, and perhaps where we're going. Um, I, I guess it sort of starts with Al Gore. Maybe he created the internet. Um, <laughs> but the, the fact of the matter is that the internet, it, it'd be an understatement to say the internet is you know, reshaping commerce and society. It is having a profound effect on all of our lives. And it is due in part because of good policy choices we made here in the US. It's no coincidence that the biggest internet companies originate and are based in the United States. And it's because Congress said a couple of things. First, we're gonna protect intermediaries from liability. Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act was really important. It ensured that companies like Twitter and Facebook, Facebook are not responsible for the content that you and I post online. It ensures that ISPs are not liable for what you and I say online. Um, we also made sure that the internet was not going to get taxed. And in a bipartisan way, we renewed the Internet Tax Freedom Act several times, and it's up for expiration this year. And as the internet is reshaping our domestic, domestic economy, a lot of these internet companies are growing and looking to do business overseas, and they are continuing to come, continually coming to us saying, hey, we got some things right in the US, but we're having lots of problems overseas. How do we, how do we fix this? And so a few years ago in the Finance Committee, we started holding hearings. And our first hearing was three years ago. And we heard basically two messages. First, we don't know how big this economy is. Uh, we don't know quite how to measure it. And the second thing we heard is, by the way, you know, countries like China are blocking Google and Facebook, while Chinese companies like Baidu and Renren are coming 
to the New York Stock Exchange raising money and doing, doing well at that. So what we did from that hearing is really work with Chairman Bacchus and convinced him to request a, what's called a 332 report by the ITC. And the first 332 report is the one that, that Meredith described, and the second one is coming out next year. And that's the first step to try and figure out first how big this economy is and what the barriers are. And the first report's good. It's kind of an overview of, of literature that's out there, and, and we're really looking forward to the, the second report, which will kind of do a deeper dive and, and get some, some broader industry perspective. From, from, from there, and the, and the first hearings and the, the understanding that we needed to understand this economy better, you know, the USTR did a really good job of socializing this issue, first in the APEC discussions of 2011, and then ultimately in terms of tabling text within TPP on cross-border data flows and, and forced localization of things like server, uh, server infrastructure and data. And then from that, you know, Senator Wyden and, and Senator Thune recognized that there was going to be a discussion on trade promotion authority and have worked to really influence the discussion around what the, the negotiating objectives ought to be for TPA and, and broader issues. And here we are today, one day before a hearing on trade <coughs> promotion authority in the Finance Committee. And, it, you know, I think it's, not only has the internet kind of transformed the economy, but it's, you know, we're really rethinking our, our trade policy. It's remarkable to me that three years ago, nobody was talking about digital trade in a meaningful way. And here we are today, you know, Chairman Bacchus, Ranking Member Hatch have components of digital trade in their TPA bill. And the administration is really leaning in on these issues. And it's, it's gonna be an interesting discussion uh, and negotiation at TPP in the weeks ahead and, and certainly for TTIP. So it's exciting times and it's just critically important to, to the trade agenda to make sure that we're focusing on this segment of the economy because it's important to job creation and innovation, but it's also a really good news story as you saw by the chart that Meredith put up. We're winning right now and we're gonna win more in the future. We've got a trade surplus uh, year over year and it's, it's broadening and we gotta keep the momentum up. So I'll stop there. Great, thank you. Um, let me start with the first question, which is that when you look at the politics of the internet, um, there's a whole set of pressures that come from companies who want to reshape things and maybe erode some of the American advantage. And we'll, if you look particularly at, at um, some European countries, uh, Brazil, uh, perhaps China, uh, there's a sense that the U.S. share is larger and needs to be brought down in some way, right? So you can hear this directly from these, uh, at least the governments when you talk to them. So what do you think the right response, and let me ask all three panelists, what's the right response here? We are the winners in the internet game, in part because we were the first movers. One of the things I do when I talk to some officials is they'll complain about competitiveness, anti-competitiveness, and I'll ask them to name the national competitor in their country. That usually stops the conversation. But I think the politics of the internet now are, there'll be an effort to push back on what you see as this US lead to change the rules in ways that will um, favor foreign competition. What do you think the right response is? That was a long question, sorry, but. I suppose my, my first response would be that the, the, the things that Jamie cited as far as the popularity of, of US internet sites, this is something that's consumer driven. I mean, this is, this is not, these are not national champions of ours. This is not an industrial policy that has led to this. So my reaction would be that, that if the desire is for there to be better Chinese, better European, better Brazilian internet companies, then as a, as a consumer, I, I, I would support companies tr trying to get their start there and try and offer something better to me as a consumer, but trying to tilt the field by, by balkanizing the internet in, in, in some ways and trying to change the structure of the internet is 100% the wrong approach. I, I would just say that I, I think in large part the reason these companies are doing so well is because we have an open internet that is not regulated and 
it's given an opportunity to upstarts and insurgents to compete with industry incumbents. And that is, we've, we can all cite lots of internet companies that fail, um, as many that succeed. And it's because it, it is, really is a platform for, for competition and innovation. And you know, it's in part because of the laws that we have here. And it's why I think if we can export some of these disciplines, uh, foreign countries will do much better than they are now. Um, it's not a matter of, of the U.S. trying to stay ahead of everybody else by pushing people down. We want to see, and I think the administration wants to see this too, is how can we help countries grow economically by pursuing internet policies that, that contribute towards, towards innovation, competition, and growth? Loads of questions, so yeah, I can talk for hours. So go ahead. Well, I, I would just uh, comment that uh, both uh, in both Jeffrey and Jamie's remarks, uh, it strikes me that there's uh, the cusp of this issue is there's a collision between this this bottom-up open-source industry that developed and developed, frankly, faster than any ind any industry in history, to my knowledge. I mean, if you look at the course of innovation in human history. Uh, look at the automobile, look at, look at uh, civil aviation, uh, even electrification. Big game-changing industries, none of them had the, the rate of consumer adoption of, of internet-based commerce. It, it's really astonishing how fast it's come. And uh, my sense is that the, because it happened so fast and generated so many benefits for so many people, the industry got lucky. They got lucky with light regulation and, and, a, and, and a sort of a soft touch, hands-off approach, as Jeffrey described. Uh, that is unlikely to continue. And the fact is, you know, if you, if you look at the early days, this was all really easy. ITA in 1997 was really easy because nobody had a big business. No, no country was generating a lot of tariffs from, uh, from electronics production. So going to zero tariffs on information technology equipment was, was no big deal. Same with the moratorium on taxation of the internet. Well, nobody, it wasn't a revenue source in the first place. So it was, it was, it was easy to say yes. Um, uh, I, I think we particularly got lucky with, uh, with fair use and the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. There were some provisions there that are astonishingly beneficial, like internet service provider liability protection. Uh, that nobody knew were that beneficial at the time. So, and the fair use, of course, goes back into English common law. We just got lucky. So, uh, I think the luck has run out, and you can see that in the sort of top-down approach. And in many economies, not just I think Jim's concern is right about uh, about national champions and and uh, and disappointment about American market share in in, in foreign economies. But there's, a, there's an instinct to, to, for top-down regulation to treat this as a strategic industry and, to, and to, to take the commanding heights. You know, this has happened before. It, you know, energy production, oil and gas production, hydrocarbon production was at one time a bottom-up open source deal. You know, in 1890, Standard Oil had 80% of the share of, uh, of uh, oil production and distribution in the world. Okay, and now ExxonMobil, the successor company, has 2%. <laughs> Okay, and 90% of the shares with government entities. Okay, so this can happen. Okay, and my my sense is we're on the cusp of something. And my question to the pan to panelists, particularly Jeffrey and, and Jamie, because Congress needs to uh, needs to account for the fact that speed kills in this one, and and there, there there's a likelihood of 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 uh, a lot of a lot of really bad regulation happening in foreign economies that will be very difficult for us to defend against without a more strategic look. So I just seek a reaction to that. If there is one. I would just say I totally agree, which is why it is really important that we get TPP right first, yeah. because that, as you can see from the chart, we've got a lot of trade in Asia, but it will set a template and a benchmark for how we do TTIP and every other trade agreement that follows. So getting, getting this right in TPP is going to be incredibly important. And you know, I, I credit the administration for taking on this issue early. Uh, they, they have good provisions that they put forward. I, th I think that Jeffrey and I both agree that they can be doing some more, especially on, on liability issues. Um, 
but but that just I think your remarks just speak to the importance of getting this right in TPP, TTIP, and TPA. Uh, well, thank you so much. I mean, I, I wonder, you know, why would a director of a Europe program be sitting here at a digital trade uh, discussion? And I, I, I was thinking, I, I think particularly as Jamie was talking, you know, as I look at the TTIP, the Transatlantic Trade Investment Program, in some uh, partnership, in some ways there's two revolutions that this trade agreement is, is addressing. One is the unconventional oil and gas revolution and the competitive advantage that the United States may have in an enormous way for energy. And then I would say it's the online revolution, both from a data protection perspective, um, but I, I would also um, argue uh, it's also trying to open up and expand new markets. And uh, Jeff, I particularly appreciated your focus on the small and medium size, what I even call it, the micro, uh, the individual who's uh, selling something uh, and wants to expand those markets. It's not even just the data protection uh, issues, safe harbor, and I'll talk about that in a moment, and the difficult politics that are going to come into play on safe harbor because of the Snowden revelations. But we actually have physical barriers that still exist, uh, and I think in some ways the administration's focused on the uh, trusted trader program. How do you allow the smallest um, uh, exporters to participate in some of these programs? How do you open that up? And then a second thought would be, how do you create an environment? We, we have a slogan, uh, CSIS uh, adjunct fellow, uh, Kati Samanen calls it aid for E-Trade. How do we help get those numbers, Asia, Latin America, a part of this online revolution? How do we stimulate that? How do we show uh, Brazilian leaders and others that this revolution can happen, but it has to be transparent, open, free? And how does the United States and Europe to actually potentially open that up. So those are two very important ideas. For TTIP to be successful, and, and maybe, Jamie, I'd have a slightly different theme, I think we have to get TTIP really right on this issue because of the figures that Meredith showed up there. There's an enormous amount of trade uh, in the digital services, and I fear politically more barriers are going to be placed in its way of development because of privacy data protection concerns. We've always had them, but we found a way to bridge them. Now the politics may not be there to bridge them anymore, and how are we going to, uh, to address that? But, you know, TTIP and TTP, but TTIP particularly, this is about getting ahead in the future. This is not about dealing with the GMOs and the agriculture, the fights we've had for 15 years. It's about leapfrogging and getting, you know, focusing on the future of international trade. If we get that right, we've already set the standards. So high bar, huge issues, um, uh, but the potential here is transformative, I think, for the transatlantic economy uh, and, and setting the, the tone and tenor for, for the international economy. So extremely exciting. So thank you, Jim, for bringing us all together to talk about this. Uh, thanks, Heather. Um, well, let me ask a question then, building off Heather's remarks, and then hopefully, we knew we'd have to do a few questions to warm you guys up, and hopefully after I do this, you'll be ready to talk. But um, I was in uh, China at a, a big internet conference uh, a couple months ago. Uh, it was really interesting because it was an all Chinese conference, right? There were only about 20 Americans there out of the 4,000 people. And you could have dropped the audience into Silicon Valley without, they were all in t-shirts and running shoes and blue jeans and they had backpacks. They would have fit right in. And the thing that was interesting to me was that the Chinese internet companies are a sector apart in some ways. They're independent, they're innovative, they're aggressive. I got to talk to a couple CEOs of some of the big companies like Tencent and uh, 360. They want to come into the Western market. Their question was, how do I get into the U.S. market? So the question I have for the panelists is, we're used to being the, the, most, uh, the, the, the most active player in this space, but I think, you know, and I wouldn't say this for other industries in China, we're going to see Chinese companies wanting to get into the global market and wanting to play and particularly wanting to play in the American market. How do we make sure that's a level playing field? And just to throw in a word that most of you probably know, will there be CFIUS concerns? I mean, if we could look at them buying a, a ham company, what will we do when they, uh, <laughs> what will we do when they want to buy an internet company? So we have, a, we have a powerful 
companies out there, a group of Chinese internet companies that will, you know, be real competitors. What do you think we ought to do about that? I don't have an answer. I think I have a question, and maybe Jeffrey might have some ideas. Um, but I think you're right. You know, when you have a business model, or you, you have a business model in the internet economy that's about getting personal people's personal information. There has clearly been some level of comfort with that here domestically, and m maybe it's because people are younger and they're used to used to it. Um, I don't don't know fully. But what are people going to do when the data is being captured by Chinese companies or Brazilian companies or companies we'd be less familiar with or less trustworthy of? And will that drive uh, the U.S. to look at, at data policies and privacy policies in ways that hasn't before? I don't have the answer. It's kind of a Commerce Committee thing. But I, I think that it's a question we have to start grappling with. I would say fundamentally we, we shouldn't shy away from the competition. I mean, that would be the, the, the sort of starting point for, for everything. But in, in terms of dealing with countries that, that have different political values than us, like the, the Chinese, maybe we'll have to be creative in, in thinking about, you know, how, how we address some of those concerns. But I, I think that, you know, going to what Jamie said, the, the reason it's so critical to get a lot of this right now is because you know, we're, we're all talking about companies moving things on, on eBay or, or uh, you know, a, a health company trying to move personal records across, across borders. Um, but things are about to get a, a lot more complicated really, really fast. And I would say two things in particular are going to make this an even more complicated situation, which is why we need to make sure we have uh, robust and forcible binding rules now. Uh, the first thing would be the Internet of Things, and this is something that was talked a lot about at the Consumer Electronics Show a couple of weeks ago. Um, and th you know, this is sort of the idea that we're going to have sensors attached to you know myriad of devices that are going to be uh, monitoring and, and informing behavior. Uh, and the second thing is is big data. And so these two these two events are, are going to really change in a lot of ways how businesses make decisions, how consumers make decisions, and they're going to be quite complicated from a policy perspective in terms of how that data is treated, how that data is able to uh, go across servers and whatnot. And I, but I think that it really it, it makes sense to try and get this right now because once those things come online fully, uh, it's going to be a lot more of a, a political uh, mess to really deal with. Yeah, I would say I'm really, I'm always optimistic, but I'm optimistic that we're going to get this right, continue to get this right at home, and get this right in trade agreements for two reasons. I think somebody mentioned politics. There, there were two events over the last couple of years that, that lead me to be optimistic. W one is the, the Pippa Sopa, you know, experience. You know, this is the, 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 the internet censorship bill that, you know, it was, a, it was an IP bill that reached too far. And, you know, it, you had the Chamber of Commerce and organized labor for it. You'd think that Congress would be for it. And, you know, 8 million Americans spoke up on one day and Congress changed its mind. So there's that. There is the politics on internet freedom or on the side of internet freedom. The, the second thing that happened, it was less reported on in the U.S. anyway, is the U.S. had led negotiations on the anti-counterfeit trade agreement. And Europe was about to consider it. And it seemed like it was a slam dunk. Um, and kind of the same thing happened in Europe as to what happened on Pippa Sopa. There was public backlash, especially by young people. And the Europeans just flatly rejected it after a groundswell of opposition. I had European members of parliament in saying, my kids are going nuts about this ACTA thing. What is it? We've never read it. This is a problem. And, and ACTA was dead, basically defeated by the Europeans. So I think the politics, both at home and I suspect over uh, in Europe, are, are on the side of internet freedom. While we're waiting for you to think of a question, I will tell you one story, which is I uh, meet with the Chinese government every once in a while, and they said, why are you always complaining? Um, we all use American credit cards, and so all of our personal data is stored in the U.S. And I thought, oh, we don't store it in the U.S., we store it in India. And they went, <laughs> <laughs> So one of the issues that I think is just going to be really hard to wrestle with is this is 
trans it's not a bilateral issue it's a right. trans border issue right. and you have data stored everywhere in the world and there's real efficiencies from that but it raises um, concerns some legitimate like privacy and some perhaps not so legitimate anti-competitive um, that are going to make people push back so go ahead yes it's time for you we're just stringing along until somebody uh, well, I figured I'd be the first. So thank you, Jim. I'm Jake Colvin from the National Foreign Trade Council. I wanted to, first of all, I thank all of you for your leadership on, uh, on digital trade issues. Uh, Meredith, you mentioned the number of questionnaires that you sent out uh, for the study, and I, I don't think it's well understood um, how wide a net that the ITC cast on this. And you know, having met with some of your staff and talked about how they met with Dropbox and Pinterest and um, Tumblr, I, people tend to think of you know Amazon Google, Microsoft, uh, Apple is, uh, as you know, the big game in town, and they are. But um, I think it's important what, what you're doing to, to make sure that you're emphasizing that there's a, a whole broad universe of companies out there. And so, thank you, uh, and thank you both, uh, Jeff and, and Jamie, for your leadership on the Digital Trade Act. And uh, my question is for you. Uh, I was wondering uh, if you've had a chance to assess how the TPA draft compares to the um, provisions that you've had that, that you put forward in the Digital Trade Act. Uh, we've noticed that uh, under the IP chapter, uh, the provisions are, are largely similar to what they were the last time the TPA bill came out and, and was passed. Uh, and uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I didn't see anything specifically in there on uh, intermediary liability or, or the balance of rights, limitations, and exceptions uh, for copyright. And so I was, I was wondering if you could give um, sort of a brief initial assessment of, of how TPA um, sits with respect to the, the universe of digital trade issues and if there's anything that you envision doing to, to maybe change what's in there? Well, thank you to Jake. Jake has been somebody who's doing a lot of thinking on digital trade for quite a bit of time and it certainly has been a, a resource to, to uh, both of our offices, I think. Uh, I would start by just repeating what I said in the beginning, which is that we, you know, we, we really appreciate the fact that there is digital trade language uh, that's, that's in the TPA bill, and, and certainly a lot of it is, is consistent or, or very similar to what's in our Digital Trade Act, and, and we appreciated the chairman and ranking member uh, hearing our concerns. Uh, in terms of, of what the differences are and, and, and what our posture is going to be going forward, I, I think it's pretty early days in terms of, of, of how things will proceed. I think the hearing tomorrow will be interesting in terms of what the member's reaction is. Uh, as far as what's in the IP chapter, I, you know, what you said is, is my understanding as well. Um, and again, in terms of, of you know, what that means for how the bill might change going forward, I, I couldn't really comment right now. I, I would just, we're kind of in the same position. Um, I would say, you know, we're very pleased that they put some provisions in there and, and there's a real focus on it. I think the key question is, is what do their words mean or what, what does USTR think their words mean? Um, you know, Jeff and I have some experience trying to figure out what words mean and how to negotiate them. And we have views about them, but what ultimately we need to understand is what does USTR think they mean? And, I th you know, I, my sense is the words can be clear on liability uh, and, and issues like, like fair use, but I think getting some feedback from the USTR is going to be the key. Because even the current language on IP, the USTR is, is doing some good things in terms of limitations and, and exceptions. Um, does the current language push them in that direction or solidify those points of view? We don't know. Hi, I'm Katherine Hauser. Uh, Meredith, congratulations on the report. I was very pleased to participate in one of the rounds of hearings that you had leading up to this first edition. Um, I agree with Scott's um, view that there could be a collision between the top down and bottom up, but I do think there's another threat that I wonder if could be reflected in the second version. You know, it's really nice to get lulled by the strength that the U.S. has in this area. But just look at the consumer backlash now to the cyber threat 
of people's credit card information being swiped by Target and a whole bunch of other retailers, the size of which has not yet been determined. The implications are huge. When you look at your chart showing the financial services industry's interest in um, using the internet and IT to become more efficient and so forth. The implications of this cyber threat on the, finan on the payment system is something I think we really need to think about. Not just catching the guys who um, stole the information, but what ripple effects are there going to be in the retail and commercial banking or in the broader <coughs> financial services industry? And I just have a gut feeling that while it's easy to say young people are used to the internet and they're happy to give away their privacy on Facebook, when it comes to cyber th um, theft, um, taking, you know, getting to the heart of people's pocketbooks, I think there can be a real backlash here. And I think we're making a mistake to go into TPA negotiating language thinking that this issue isn't going to come into the broader issue. And it, it kind of is a way to sideline into the Europeans' view that, ah, see, you Americans have never protected privacy enough. But privacy and cybersecurity have never really been talked about jointly. They, in my view, they've been different silos. And now we have a huge, huge issue in the US. Um, with this Target and all these other retailers who can't tell how many, 70 million files were stolen. I mean, the numbers are staggering, but we don't really know that that's the end of the issue. So it seems to me we've got to find a way to talk, talk about this issue, um, maybe not as a negotiating objective, but the issue is bigger than just the I hate to sound pejorative, but the happy talk about the U.S. dominates in this industry and how are we going to keep our competitive position. It is such a transnational activity with the payment system that I think it's a real threat to what we're trying to preserve here. So my two cents. I mean, just as a reaction to that, and I'm speaking on my, my own opinion, of course, we have six commissioners and I'm just one. but. Um, in my experience, trade negotiators don't do well if you don't have a domestic consensus on something. And a trade agreement is not the best place to work out a domestic consensus. And I think when you look at kind of the success of our legal regime and how it has supported a very successful economy, you know, the kind of in innovation without permission, I think, is what the Internet Association talks about, where we have, you know, a constitution, we have the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, we have other sorts of legislation and the in the Commerce Committee's jurisdiction that have, you know, protected intellectual property but balanced it with all the different concerns. Um, we have a good regime here, but it's a domestic regime that is suddenly under threat from changes in the technology and the fast-moving nature of the economy. Um, and so I think it's, it's, it's incumbent on us to, to work on the domestic consensus just as soon as we can or we're going to miss the international opportunities that su successful trade agreements give us. And I, I remember doing negotiating objectives in, in Trade Promotion Authority in 2002, and I can tell you we took the Digital Millennium Copyright language and put it into the TPA, and it was easy because we, it was done and the people that knew about it figured it out and we'd had a, a bill that had passed, and you know, once you get a consensus in Congress, it's a, it's a very powerful thing. In, in an area like that, but it, it, there's a question on whether our, you know, our trade policy mechanisms can keep up with the speed of what's going on in the economy and, and in, in these, the, the threats to these generally agreed policies. So. Just to follow up, I, I mean, I think on cyber, there isn't a domestic consensus, right? There's a, there was a House bill that got through and the Senate did not because of di disagreements. But on, on the issue of Target, and I think it was Neiman Marcus and others, it seems to me there's also a, a, an awfully large market incentive for these guys to do a better job of securing data. I don't, think, I don't think they need the government to tell them to do a better job. I think their sales <laughs> figures probably suggest that they're going to be very uh, inclined to figure out what went wrong and, and ensure that it doesn't happen again. Probably some legal reasons, too. 
the risk in this in international trade. I think you're right about the market incentives, but the risk is most problems of the internet have a solution that, that reads something like local, forced localization. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's what I worry about, the becoming the default solution. And keep in mind, we had a banking crisis in 2008 and the default solution was forced localization. Mm -hmm. The one agreement the G20 has ever reached is everybody fix their own banks. <laughs> Okay, and there's going to be a tendency when these kind of problems arise, the default, whatever the problem is, the solution will be, let's localize it. That's going to screw this industry up pretty badly, and we probably should think about what, what the real options are instead of the default. It's interesting, though, because the um, data doesn't yet show uh, that people are uh, reducing their use of uh, the internet for commercial purposes in response to these activities. And we at CSIS have been tracking this for a few years. It looks like it's about, at most, this is a rough estimate, um, a third of a percent of uh, global GDP for the total cost of, uh, of cybercrime. And that doesn't seem to have affected behavior, right? And even when you look now at the increased use of mobile devices, particularly in developing countries, yeah. um, lots of economic opportunity, uh, a growth area for crime, it, it doesn't seem to knock people off. It may distort how they use these things, but so far we haven't seen that effect. I know the uh, European uh, Union did a survey, the ITU did a survey, and what it found is you know, people said, yeah, I'm concerned, but I'm still going to be using it. So. One thing to watch is to see if that ever changes. But right now, um, you know, we looked for, you have a big disaster, like one of these uh, retailers. People, it takes about three months for people to go back to what they were doing. So far that hasn't changed. So we'll, it's one of the things to watch. It's interesting. Hi, Scott Thompson from Samsung. Uh, both Jamie and Jim mentioned uh, we're winning in terms of uh, the debate uh, over internet trade uh, internationally. I'm wondering if your definition of we, uh, meaning the United States, includes foreign-based companies who do a large chunk of their manufacturing here in the U.S. as well as their R&D, uh, or are foreign-based com companies somehow inherently different, whether they're based in South Korea or China or, or anywhere else? Um, and related to that, um, Commissioner Broadman, uh, when you put up statistics on international trade and investment, one you didn't put up was about foreign-based firms uh, doing FDI here in the United States in R&D and manufacturing, et cetera. Is that outside the scope of what the ITC is going to look at in the study, or is that something that um, you would include uh, as, as the study goes forward? Thanks. When I say we, and what I was referring to there is American exports of digital goods and services, whether they be by Samsung or Google or anybody else. The, the thing I'm trying to figure out is uh, whether, so, you know, this is like Rumint, but um, there's a Chinese uh, company that offers a, a social network service that uh, American college kids seem to prefer, right? So that's kind of different, and if they're, if they're uh, leading edge indicator, that might mean that we will see foreign firms uh, moving into this market. And I think this is just the start. We don't know if that will happen. I know the, a few Chinese internet companies measure their customers in the single digit millions in the United States. Um, whether that will change as they offer uh, different products or services. And bearing in mind, this is where you do see some effect. People do have concerns about um, Chinese companies related to politics and privacy. They probably not have those same concerns about U.S. companies, but uh, that's the place to watch, is will foreign companies begin to get a bigger market share, not in the production where they have uh, robust uh, representation, but in the services, where so far they, they largely don't. So. Steve Mitchell, Entertainment Software Association. Question for uh, Jamie and Jeff, premised on uh, Jamie's observations that it's really important to get this right, digital trade provisions right in TPP. From a personal perspective, I couldn't agree more uh, because of the fact that the language will be out there as a potential template uh, for the TTIP, perhaps even for TISA. 
And uh, I'm wondering if the objective to get it right uh, at some point uh, creates a rub with the administration's efforts to achieve quick closure of the TPP, particularly given some of the pushback that we're seeing from some countries to introduce their own uh, unique flavors of, of Internet uh, policy into, uh, into the equation, including, for example, Australia. Yeah, it's a good question, um, and it's kind of an, and Congress is in an awkward position, and the administration is in an awkward position where they are trying to conclude negotiations while at the same time they are asking the Congress for what the negotiating objectives are. Um, <laughs> so, so then what happens if there's a TPA bill that's passed that's different than what they're seeking in TPP? And, and that's a question I don't have clear, I don't have an answer. I think the, the administration is thinking about that and concern, but also having discussions with us. Um, it, it's also unclear as to, you know, it's great that the, the, that the administration's put forward some important provisions. How important are they to the administration? There's a lot of pressures in these, in these negotiations from lots of different economic sectors. And, you know, our hope is that by demonstrating the important, you know, ha having the ITC demonstrating how important this is to the U.S. economy, that there will be a corresponding priority in what, what they're willing to accept and when they're willing to close the negotiations. Yeah, I, th I also think it's an interesting point. I, I, I don't really have a, a strong sense of, of to what degree a lot of these issues will, will slow things down. I mean, I. I'm not trying to be partisan, but from Senator Thune's perspective, you know, he would have preferred the administration would have requested TPA a long time ago. Uh, maybe that would have helped solve some of these issues. Um, I think the other interesting thing to note is that perhaps the administration is learning uh, a lot. What, what I learned during the process of the Digital Trade Act, which is that this isn't an issue that, that is just something for technology and internet companies, and that it does affect many, many industries. And so perhaps as USTR has learned these same lessons, it's, it's you know, elevated these issues somewhat in, in terms of the things that, that they're negotiating on, uh, and, and that, that may well have the result of, of slowing things down. Um, I have a measurement question, so this will be mainly uh, aimed at Meredith, but one of the things that's come up in the last couple of years is the, the difficulty of uh, one, uh, measuring services, and two, measuring what you could call the global supply chain component of these things. So that the, some arguments you've heard in the WT and other places is that the, the old notion we have of sort of national-based metrics doesn't uh, adequately capture what's going on. And so do you think we have the right metrics? How would you change them? Where do you want to go? What do you think the future will be for that? Yeah, I mean, I think that the global supply chain uh, concept is out there, and we, you know, we work with it as other organizations do. Um, and I, I'm not sure that it's it's more our job to kind of understand it. Not that I completely do, because it's not my area of specialty, but more to, more understand it and present it in an objective analytical analytical way to Congress, and they can use it or not use it, and as they choose their priorities. But. I think understanding, you know, the value of, you know, developing countries in particular, be, being able to, to get into a niche market of some sort of brake component of an automobile, you, look, you know, look at Thailand or something, what they're, what they're able to do, and the, the key contribution it makes to economic development in the developing world and just kind of cooperation and partnerships throughout a number of countries as these products go back and forth across borders many, many times. Um, so I think you'll see us doing a little more on the supply chain issue, but we, um, you know, don't have anything uh, to announce yet, and we'll be sort of consulting with the, our committees of jurisdiction to see if they want us to do more more in that area. <laughs> uh, 
yesterday i obviously the court decision came out and it was quite quite eventful and certainly you know interesting from our perspective i think maybe i don't know senator wyden made comments on it or not but perhaps senator wyden and senator thune would have different perspective on on how different elements of the case turned out senator thune has commented that there were both good and bad parts of the court decision i think there's some elements we prefer the dissenting view i think that's fair um and so whether or not that affects digital trade policy i i i haven't thought that through exactly i i think that you know this is where jamie and i may diverge a little bit you know from our perspective prior to the open internet rules we had a thriving internet in which a lot of these companies that we're all clamoring to say good things about were, were thriving beforehand and i think that that says in a, uh, to a large degree why the open internet rules the fcc put forward weren't, weren't necessary in the first place um we have a different view on net neutrality uh but i will say that if foreign countries are carving up the internet into fast lanes and slow lanes in very obvious ways the u.s will want to take that on and what kind of position are we in if we don't have rules to prevent that Um, I don't know, this might be politically incorrect. Uh, what happens if we don't get TPA? That might be for Scott and uh, Heather more than anyone else, but. Uh. <laughs> well, uh, pr practically, it makes it astonishingly difficult to close and implement tr trade agreements. I mean, we've only ever closed one free trade agreement without trade promotion authority in hand. It was the U.S. Jordan Free Trade Agreement in 2000, okay, and it, it, it was closed by the Clinton administration in the, in the, after, after uh, the, the, the 90s grant of trade promotion authority had lapsed and before the 2001 authority was implemented, and that bill was a dead letter until the terrorist events of uh, September 11, 2001. Literally, it was submitted to the, uh, to the Senate and, uh, and House uh, for implementation. Uh, at that time, Senator Phil Graham of Texas uh, took uh, umbrage with a couple of uh, provisions in the bill and put a hold on it. And that's the last anybody would ever have heard of the U.S. Jordan Free Trade Agreement. <laughs> so that's our one, it's a one data point, okay? Uh, look, Trade Promotion Authority has existed for a long time. Uh, my friend Ed Gresser says that there was actually a provision in the 1934 Reciprocal Trade Agreements Act that Franklin Roosevelt signed into law. The 34 Act had a, had a provision for uh, express impl implementation by Congress. And so ever since then, but certainly since the 74 Trade Act, the way we've done trade has, has said Congress will partner in a specific way, will set objectives, will agree to a set of consultation procedures, and then uh, if the, if the uh, agreement meets the, the objectives, it qualifies for expedited, tre expedited treatment, particularly no amendments, uh, uh, in, uh, when, when the implementing bill is, uh, is, is sent to the Congress. So that's, how, that's what we've done since 74. That's really been the foundation of trade policy. I can't imagine treating, tre treating a, a negotiation as complicated as a 12-party talks like TPP without that sort of protection. It's just, I don't know how in the world you'd get it done. I'd probably just retire. <laughs> so, but so uh, it, it's now it's difficult to speculate. So uh, all along, my, my personal point of view is the, the, the administration had three negotiations. They have TPP, they have TTIP, and they have TPA. And that's a negotiation with the Congress. It's probably the one that takes priority and the one uh, if, uh, if I were uh, in the administration, I'd be putting a great deal of attention to right now. Uh, but uh, so it's it's but it's hard to speculate beyond that. I, I I don't see practically how you close a trade agreement without authority from Congress, given the way our system works. So I will just say two things. Um, there's tremendous value in TPA, not just for the expedited procedures in Congress, which I think that value is overblown, 
So we're blown because if you just look at the Columbia experience where it was protected by fast track and the House just by a majority vote changed their rule to say we're not ready for this yet. So Congress will always do what it needs to do when it doesn't want to consider agreement and do what yeah. it needs to do to consider an agreement. Um, but the, the value of TPA, in my view, is that you know Congress is clear about what it, what it wants to obtain from a trade agreement, and Congress makes it clear what the framework for consultations with Congress are. Um, you know, I think with respect to the, the, the necessity of TPA, um, you know, it's been around since 74, and we had lots of GATT round, GATT round, rounds of GATT that were concluded and passed by the Congress. So I think the record is not as, as clear as, as you suggested. That, that's a fair point. And, and importantly, uh, very controversial issues like uh, uh, China PNTR, uh, where the Senate took up and passed the House bill without amendment, mm -hmm. uh, without any protection. So it, it certainly can be done. And we, we closed a, a, a Bali round recently, too, which was complicated. Yeah. Not the biggest of deals, important, but right. complicated. But I think we can safely say that TTIP will not be done on one tank of gas if TPA um, is not sort of provided as a those cl clarity from Congress. Because what, I, what I'm concerned about in the European uh, perspective is that TTIP really is the agenda item for US-EU relations. And the message, rightly or wrongly, that if TPA doesn't come out, that the political message it sends to all the European parliamentarian members who are running for the EP elections at the end of May, for all the French leaders that don't like this to start with, they, they aren't going to go down a very difficult political road and tackle some of the most difficult trade issues because they don't see the domestic clarity from us. So I think it also it just sends a message to our partners that, okay, we're going to take a step back too, so why am I putting my neck out to tackle GMOs, to tackle geographic, you know, whatever the tough stuff is, because clearly the political message from here may be we're not ready to tackle some of those tough issues. So it's sort of that the reality versus the perception, and I fear the political perception for our European partners if TPA gets clogged up and then that sort of pushes back TPP potentially and then certainly way pushes back TTIP, now it's the political message that you have to worry about. I hope I'm wrong, but I, I no, fear that you're right. the I mean, perception. When Congress and the administration do this wonderful <laughs> dance where Congress goes in and asks for a lot or right. you know does a lot of saber rattling and I think that the TPA can, can be very valuable in sending the political message that USTR is negotiating, what USTR is asking for has broad political support in, in the country. I just wanted to, I mean, I think Heather raised an interesting point as it relates to the European Parliament, which is that th things have changed in the EU in terms of the, the Parliament now has a lot more say in how a lot of this goes down. And I think that Jamie had mentioned earlier about ACTA, that was kind of you know, round one in seeing how this goes, and it went as it went. And now this is round two, at least from, from our perspective. And so um, I, I hadn't thought about this until Heather made the comment, but, but it, it will be an interesting indicator to, I think, a lot of those, those EPs. I was just gonna add a comment that, you know, this really isn't your father's TPA. I mean, just look at the increase of trade in its importance in our economy since the 86 Act or the 74 Act. The issues we're talking about, even in this agenda today on digital trade, is much more pervasive in our economy, which leads me to the conclusion, having been a USTR negotiator and having worked on the Senate Finance Committee, we need much broader and deeper consultation with m more members of Congress than we used to just consult with finance and ways and means. It was a pretty much a slam dunk. Can't do that anymore. It has to be much broader and deeper and take much more time. And so it, it, I think we, are, we have to be careful that we don't make such a rush to get TPA that it comes back to bite us if we don't have the broad consensus among um, members of Congress that we need. Can I just make one quick comment about that? It's just that it, it would be, if, if we were not going to get TPA, it would be an unfortunate outcome 
if for no other reason than a lot of the criticism of t p a right now has been the lack of congressional consultation and then by not having t p a you're losing your ability to consult so it it's sort of a chicken egg thing but it's a it's an awkward outcome it would be an unfortunate outcome Thanks, Catherine. <laughs> um, thank you for the, all of y'all's comments. It's been really enlightening to me. Um, and I wanted to follow on the conversation on TPA. Um, and I think your last comment was, was uh, a very interesting possible hook um, to uh, help uh, make the argument for a bipartisan, bicameral approval of TPA. Um, my comment is that this is the most toxic period, um, certainly since 1974, maybe, maybe since 1934, when it comes to um, the, the Congress and its uh, relationship with the White House. Um, Scott and I were just at, a, I think, a very interesting uh, discussion by uh, Norm Ornstein, which of course goes into the tribalism and toxicity which um, is permeating everything. And one of the main takeaways was that how little is getting done in Congress and is scheduled to get done um, by the leadership uh, in this Congress. TPA and every trade agreement that has been hard lifting has, it seems to me, I don't know if it's 100% of the time, it's been done in the lame duck sessions. Um, it, it's always been the hardest thing to get um, from a, 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 to get a, a buy-in on a trade agreement. And it, ultimately, many of the times it had ha that, that there has been agreement on a trade agreement, we've had to re resort to national security arguments. Um, I'm thinking about uh, the senior President Bush and textile agreements. I mean, we had to make a national security argument to get that done. So given the toxicity, I, I, all I, I guess my comment is it's highly ironic to be thinking um, that we can get TPA uh, this year. And uh, maybe the argument is, well, it, the President won't consult anymore unless we, get, we have this consultative process. I think that's a very interesting argument that I hadn't heard before. No, the only brief comment I would make is that while things are toxic on a lot of places, I, you know, I, our working relationship with Senator Wyden's office from Senator Thune's perspective has been remarkable. There's a whole, whole host of, of other things in addition to the Digital Trade Act that our two offices have worked on. And so you know, I, I think it, it, it may not say much, but it says something about the degree to which members of the Senate can, can get together, at least on, on discrete topics, and, and try and forge ahead. And Chairman Camp. Camp and Chairman Camp and Chairman Baucus introduced right. the same bill. That's so right. there's bicameral bipartisan. That's right. It's, it's just ironic. Let's hope yeah. it works. Yeah. I would just say that the challenges that you have described are, are, are there, um, but there is bipartisan interest in doing something. I think the, the question is how much and what the timing is. It is complicated by TPP because of the politics. People are going to conflate the vote on TPA with the vote on TPP. That's yeah. the concern yeah. that I hear about. And, and it's what I'm hearing from a lot of staff is that it's hard to distinguish the two votes, especially if there isn't a TPP agreement to describe. Mm -hmm. That's the challenge mm -hmm. that I hear about. Uh, Steve Mitchell again, another question for Jamie and Jeff, and sorry to be piling on. I'm wondering if you see a congressional role for helping to face down the uh, threatened server location mandates that are starting to take shape in Brazil and Indonesia, among other countries. I mean, I think it starts with the, the trade agenda, and we're not negotiating with Brazil and other countries, but if you know, I think if we can get a good TPP agreement that addresses that issue and we're getting consensus from our trading partners on that issue, 
that gives ourselves and our trading partners some leverage in Geneva, ultimately. I, I think I had mentioned at the outset that while while our legislation, while we're trying to influence pieces of legislation, it, it, a lot of it also is about creating a coalition of, of members who are interested in these subjects and to be able to have a, a group of senators who can weigh in as events unfold. And so I, I prior to introducing the Digital Trade Act, our bosses wrote a joint op-ed in the Wall Street Journal on this subject. That was our, that was our first piece of work um, between our two offices. And we did make mention of specific instances where localization requirements were, were problematic. Uh, and certainly, I, you know, I think that that got the attention of, of some countries. And you know, we're, we're looking to try and do what we can to, to influence those events as well. You know, I think in the particular example of, of Brazil, uh, as Jamie mentioned, we're not negotiating with them. Um, but the threat of contagion you know, in, in South America or, or as other countries do it in, in their regions, that's something that really, I think, concerns concerns our office because uh, there's definitely a Me Too attitude when, when a country the size of Brazil takes certain measures. It, it really only increases the incentives for, for other countries in, in the area to do the same. Brazilians, of course, have a meeting coming up in April with a group of countries on uh, internet governance where I think localization will come up, where they've been going around uh, seeking support from other South American countries, from other leading uh, G77 or NAM countries like Indonesia. So this topic will come up. The part that I think is the ray of sunshine here, and it may not be enough of a ray, is that the, the economics of localization don't make any sense. And certainly the bigger companies, and even in countries like Brazil, realize that they will be hurt by this and that growth will be hurt. Um, whether that's enough to uh, deter uh, this, I don't know, but at least it gives you an option. What I've been doing is emailing people to post out an article on Petrobras uh, last week, and I've been emailing them that and saying, is this the model you want for the Internet? <laughs> uh, oddly enough, no one has said yes, but, um, you know, there is a real push here, but I think it's political, and you've, you've seen some pushback from the companies in, in countries that have companies that are looking at a global stage or looking at a global market. So we'll, we'll see how that plays out, but it will be hard. Um, oh, go ahead. Oh. You kind of addressed my, the question, Caroline Alessa with Reed Elsevier, but I was picking back um, on, on the question on Brazil, because it's very hard to discuss forced localization with a country like Brazil, which believes that local content requirements is a way of encouraging and in incentivizing the, the, indus the local industry. So what are the right talking points? Like how can we address and how can we talk about these negative um, consequences of forced localization in a way that countries like Brazil would understand? I understand that it's politically um, driven the debate. Obviously, President Rousseff is expecting an apology from Obama on the whole privacy. But how can the private sector engage even more actively with, with countries like Brazil and Indonesia and, and others that might come? So, but you kind of addressed it. But if anyone has any additional comments, that would be great. My, my only comment would be that, that from industry that is, that is in Brazil, it, to the degree to which you can point out that these requirements may degrade the level of service that the average Brazilian receives, to me, that's the, the way that you speak most clearly on this topic. I mean, the average internet user is not particularly interested in, in you know, which servers you're using or whether or not it adds to your marginal cost or, or whatnot. But when you start talking to them about whether or not their personal internet experience is going to change or whether or not their personal experience using a different product that is somehow or another using the internet, uh, I think that's where, where you, you may actually uh, get some traction. And in the internet economy, knowledge is dispersed. It's very widely dispersed. And it's one of the, the, the powerful elements and the reason for the pace of innovation. What you're, what you're doing by employing sort of infant industry arguments, which is how lo local, local content and local uh, forced localization get justified based on the infant industry arguments that have been made for hundreds of years. Yeah, that somehow we're going to build up our own industry. It ignores the benefits that accrue from this wide dispersal of knowledge. And what Brazil is really doing is cutting itself off from that. I would note that 
it was Chinese scientists who saved Google in China. It was Chinese, Chinese scientists who went to the government and said, we're going to get cut off from our colleagues in the world if Google doesn't operate here. And it made a major political difference. So uh, in terms of mobilizing resources, I would, I would look to the centers of knowledge in Brazil, which there are some. There's R&D done there and things like that. And the degree to which it is, it is not contained in Brazil. It is, there may be people in Brazil, but they are corresponding with and connecting with and building knowledge with, uh, with people outside. So uh, that, that's where I'd look. Just went, I, mean, I, I liked your question on advocacy because uh, it's important, but I think you know we all need to realize that a lot of these problems aren't going to be solved in a really fundamental way unless we have an ongoing trade agenda. I mean, if we're negotiating with other countries, that will put pressure on Brazil. There's a lot of things that, that the Brazilians need in this market, and we're going to have to figure out. You know, we just gave them some ethanol tariffs recently, and we got no no additional access because no one asked for it. So there's a little bit of coordination that has to go on here. We all have market objectives in each of our markets, and the process of kind of building a unified set of negotiating objectives that are generally agreed between Republicans, Democrats, and the President, uh, it makes the U.S. very, very powerful. But, you know, that's sort of job one, I think, at this point. Okay. Uh, just a last point. I think as as uh, internet companies grow in places like Brazil, and as these countries ca kind of catch up to the U.S. and the EU, our interests kind of naturally align, right? So part of this is we're out ahead and trying to to create some standards and some disciplines, uh, and we're getting pushback. But ultimately, I'm confident that they'll kind of get to where we are because their companies are going to grow and thrive too. Hi, Lori Dando, U.S. State Department. Just in response to that, um, I, I guess the pushback we're getting from countries who are trying to uh, address that localization barriers, which is at the top of your list, is that because the U.S. is so far ahead, they need to get somehow a leg up on us by, by uh, preferential market access or these localization. How do you respond to that agreement? I mean, yes, their, their interests would align with us when they get to where we are, but they're not there yet. And, they, and they, one of the arguments we're getting is that they, they need these additional restrictions, barriers, in order to get where we are. I, I think that in, in the United States, we have creative destruction. We have companies that have come and gone, and we have new companies that are, that are emerging out of the internet ecosystem every day. And these companies didn't come to be, they didn't become gigantic companies because they were given some type of leg up by, by the U.S. government. They used the existing internet ecosystem, they used open source materials, they hired engineers from other companies, they started with ideas in a lab or in a dorm room and then grew into huge enterprises. And so they exist today because of an open internet, not in spite of it. And I think that's the point that I would make to our trading partners, which is that we, we, we haven't tried to give a leg up to, to any company as far as, as I'm concerned, and that's not a model we should try and encourage in other countries. Yeah, and all the data uh, would support that. I mean, it just shows, and I don't know if Meredith wants to add, you know, and India is a good example. Uh, Brazil's petroleum industry is a good example. Go ahead, close yourself off and see how soon it will take you to make a competitive product. And the answer is uh, standby. And that lasts for about 10, 15 years, maybe longer. So I think the argument is this will hurt your own eco economic growth. Uh, this is a strategy that has not worked in the past. Uh, we can give you lots of examples that may be politically desirable. There will be some company countries that will move in this direction um, because it's, it's the reflection of their political attitudes. But the general argument would be this is economically harmful. It is, the, it is a free trade argument. And the, the evidence uh, in particular might be that um, you could align, and I think this gets to the point you were making, if you can align with the businesses in those countries that will be hurt, right, yeah. um, they will be the victims as much or more than American companies. 
um, if you can align with the consumers in those countries who will be hurt uh, as much and definitely probably more than American companies, um, that's where you can see some pushback. That's where these things have not worked in the past. The one exception to that rule might be uh, China, but the part that gets left out of this is China includes massive subsidies for developing national champions and for developing countries. And if Brazil or India aren't going to do those massive subsidies, we know the answer to that. Uh, this is a strategy that fails. So, a little bit of a, a sermon there, but I don't know if Meredith wants to add anything. Uh, go ahead. Well, I think I'd like to add on to the advocacy. Uh, I think because you mentioned uh, earlier the supply chain and the existence of the global supply chain, which is critically important um, to uh, industries uh, not only in the United States, but in Brazil. Uh, and the depth of uh, foreign direct investment in Brazil is uh, also very much related to the, the openness. And so uh, not only will it, you know, cr not only will those types of policies cripple um, the Brazilian infant, if you will, but it will also, um, frankly, drive away um, uh, future F foreign direct investment. Um, uh, and I'm, I'm speaking here not just from my kind of uh, policy perspective here in Washington at the ITC and on the Hill, but as sitting on corporate boards. Um, I just know how much investment is made in, in, in IT, information technology, and supply chain. And um, if a market like Brazil decides to cramp that, it, it can have an amazing ca cascading effect, maybe not immediately. Um, the, the, those individual companies will take a big hit but they'll start to shift in terms of future investment decisions. Okay, I'll pile on here. You know, Brazil did not sign on to the Information Technology Agreement, and there's been a lot of research done uh, looking at the productivity gains in the economies of those countries who did sign on to the ITA. So a point of advocacy that we may not have um, pressed as much as we might, is to talk with the finance ministries in the countries who have not signed on to the ITA as a way to demonstrate quantitatively how their economy is less productive uh, compared to those who have eliminated tariffs on the equipment side that supports the whole IT revolution. It's basically an economics argument or a business argument against a political argument. And in, in, I think in the two countries we've been talking about, India and Brazil, I'd probably vote on the bet on the political one. But in the rest of the world, uh, the economics argument can be compelling. And particularly when you look at some of the other people who might be voting on these issues to the, you know, Kenya, uh, Turkey, um, maybe some others. But we're almost at the end. Is there a final question from anyone? This is your last chance. No? Uh, go ahead. Oh.
Well, I'm not going to answer that question. <laughs> it's a more complicated discussion. Um, there 